You know when you get on an aeroplane? You know, <laughs> put that belt, put that belt around you and be prepared. <laughs> There's gonna be some turbulence along the way. If your bum goes during turbulence, you ain't gonna be an international traveler, are you? <laughs> uh, from your perspective, is expect the unexpected. Be prepared to deal with the changing environment. Be very tough with yourself. You gotta to be tougher with yourself than you are with other people. And if you don't believe in yourself and your ability to come through any obstacle or any problem, go and get another job. Because I ain't got time for you. I don't. The word pressure is, is actually invented for those people that fail. It's an excuse. And I don't like excuses. I look in the mirror and say, I ain't good enough. That's not an excuse. That's a statement. I look in the mirror and say, I will not be defeated. It's not a brag. That's the reality. And if you've got that, you'll go far, young man. I am joined by Barry Hearn, OB, founder of Matchroom Sport, to discuss his new book, My Life. Barry, welcome to the show. Thanks, mate. It's a pleasure to be here. Such such a privilege having you on. Um, so I kind of wanted to um, start off with uh, an interview of yours that I read recently. And you said that one of your motivations for writing a book was that you wanted to leave a legacy behind. You wanted to talk about your life, the ups, mm. the downs. I wonder, could you kind of just talk about your motivations really and what inspired you to write the book? Well, I mean, really, I, have to, I think I've always been terrorised by strong-minded women in my life, you know. My mum was a big inspiration to me, and you didn't disagree with my mum unless you had a, you know, death pack with the devil or something. And uh, <laughs> My wife is very similar. After 52 years, she's still the only person in the world that actually physically frightens me. But the other one I was coming up on fast on around was my daughter who had twin boys five years ago. And she turned around after a year and said, Dad, you know, you've got to write your autobiography. And I'm like, Kate, you know, too many people have got to die before I can tell the stories properly. And she said, <laughs> well, no, I'm not accepting that. She said, because I want my boys to read, you know, they want, I want them to understand where we come from as a family, what your values were, how we, how we became successful you know, what's important to us. And I would, have, I want a legacy book to hand to my, so the whole book has actually been written for my two grandchildren from, by my daughter. And I'm going to wrote, you know, Eddie's got two grand, two kids as well, two girls. So they're the four most important people. Without those four people, I wouldn't have bothered. And it took me three and a half years to do it because it is the story of my life. And although, as a salesman, a promoter, I spend a lot of time being full of bullshit and things like that. It goes with the turf. The book is as it is. You know, it's real. So, and, and I'm independent enough to say, and if people don't like it, um, I don't really care. I'm happy with this. And I think it's done a, the job it was intended to. And hopefully people will find it entertaining and in some cases illuminating. Right, right. And you raise a very good point for there because in the promotional business some people can say you know that there's a lot of bullshit out there but in your book you talk the highs you talk the lows you share a lot of detail not just of the successes but of the struggles so i wonder were you worried at all putting a lot of personal details in there not really i think you get to a certain age i think you get to a certain age where you become reflective and if you've achieved a certain amount of success, you, you sort of become truthful, if that makes sense. You're independent. So you don't really have to, it's not going to affect my life. And if someone doesn't like it, then they're not, I take the view, they're not worthy of my attention. If someone doesn't like the truth about themselves or anything else, then they don't feature. I love it. I love it. Do you think that you were born to be an entrepreneur? It's difficult to say. It's difficult to say yes or no because there was no entrepreneurial flair in my family, you know? I mean, I can look at my son, Edward, now and think to myself, I was worried about him being a rich kid, a spoiled kid, silver spoon and all that. 
but actually he's turned out to be just a, another version of me. The DNA is working and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I understand that. I'm very proud of what he's achieved on his own merit, but he also had the benefit of a great start. I didn't have that benefit, but there was no entrepreneurial activity whatsoever. The woman that influenced me was my mum. Although she was a char lady, she cleaned houses, she seemed to always want better for her kids. I suppose most mums and dads do, don't they? You know, you're a bit young for that, but that's one of the reasons why we are put on this earth to start with. And my mother was a bit of a working class snob. She, she always wanted to better herself or certainly her children. I mean, for me, she put me into the amateur dramatic society at school when I was 13. And I think she put me into elocution lessons when I was 11. And she then put me into the verse appreciation society to travel around schools, talking about Robert Graves and great poets. And this is how I, I learned how to fight a little bit at school because everyone took the mick out of me. But, but my mum would not take no for an answer. She's, and looking back on it, it's actually contributed major part to making me the person I am. So, you know, was we born to do it? No, were we encouraged to do it? Yes. I mean, it, it became quite apparent earlier doors in my life that I wasn't a rocket scientist. I wasn't going to go to Cambridge. I wasn't, but I, I found a way. I wasn't the smartest kid in the class, but I, my candle burnt longer. I had a work ethic that no one else could live with because I had a desire to be what my mother wanted me to be, to improve and be successful. And I, if I wasn't brilliant enough to have these unbelievable great ideas, I understood the graft element. Just put, you know, when people say to me today, now I'm successful, they think I know all the answers. And of course I don't. But they say to me, how do I improve the productivity of my company or myself? Or, and, I, and I always say, start an hour early and finish an hour later, son. It won't do you any harm, you know? <laughs> and it's not basic common sense like that, which makes people realize, you know, it's not all rocket science, you know. It's, there's a few basic rules of life that you have to do, but basically it comes down to grafting, doesn't it, you know? Right, you, right. You do, if you do three extra interviews a day, you've got three, you've got more chance of being successful than not, as long as the quality's good, you know? So it's, it's a simple rule of life. So I don't think we, I was born into it. I think I developed it with a bit of, my mother would say, you know, you want that, go out and get, go out and earn it, go out. So I, you know, from 12 years old, I was working in greenhouses and then picking tomato plants and stuff like that. And then 13, 14, 15, I started off window cleaning rounds, you know, car washing rounds, gardening rounds, anything to make a few quid because I wanted things, but I didn't have the money to do it, you know. So the only way I was going to get it in the first place was to get off my fat bum and go and do the graft and and it worked and i've just carried on that through all my life although you know now i'm trying to retire i've got to tell you i'm not very good at retiring it is so difficult i'm 74 in a couple of weeks time i can still kickstart jumbos you know i feel like i'm ready to do whatever uh of course i'm not but you kid yourself that you know you're not really old I can't, I'm, I'm really struggling. I, I'm, I'm telling you the truth now. It's the most difficult thing I've ever done is retiring because I can't retire. I'm, I'm hoping I can get better at it. I thought I'd just pack up and go and play cricket and golf and go fishing. You know, the, the lure of something you've done all your life is too strong sometimes to just walk away from. So I'm driving everybody here crazy. I've, I've put, every, we're at Maskell's today, we said Office of Matrim. I've put everybody in charge of various businesses and I'm still interfering which is a bit annoying for them, I think. Well, I think that's a really interesting point because, you know, you've had success, you've probably got enough money to, to last you a number of lifetimes. Uh, you know, you're still involved with snooker and other projects. Why do you think it is that you you keep going? What is the kind of... Think, do you know, I think I've tried to analyse this myself. It's very difficult. I mean, I grew up wanting to be heavyweight champion of the world from about the age of seven, I think. And I, I don't know why. I used to go to the cinema on Saturday morning with the, the other kids, and they always had Pathé News on or something there. And generally there was something about Rocky Marciano or Archie Moore or someone like that, you know. And I just love the idea. I like one against one. I mean, I, I played team games as well, but I love one against one. 
because it's, I've got no excuses. I win or I lose, and I love winning or losing. I don't want to lose, but I accept losing as part of the process of learning how to win, if that makes sense. So, you know, and then I found out that despite this enormous passion for sport, I wasn't particularly good. It's a bit of a career setback, isn't it? You know, I was, you know, annoyingly, I was okay in everything. I, I was gold medal in enthusiasm, but not even the bronze in ability. <laughs> and so you know, I've got this, I'm a frustrated sportsman that saw the light. Suddenly I saw this, you know, road to Damascus moment where I thought, I can actually be an organizer forever. Or I could be a sportsman for a limited period of my life. And I thought, I think I'd rather go down the, the ever route. And if I'm not very good, I'm not going to really be successful financially through sport, but I can be if I put my work ethic and my logistical brain and my common sense, which is the key issue of life. It's not about university degrees. It's about common sense and it's understanding what life is really about, not just the theory, the practical side. I could harness that. And I mean, uh, we started a little business in 1982 called Matrum, which was underneath a billionaire in Romford with a girl and a part-time bookkeeper, some out of the other, and I don't know how we've fluked it. We're probably the biggest sports promotion company in the world. We've offices all over the world. And we still just... We're still near enough the same people we were in 82, which is the biggest compliment I can pay to my senior people who are now enjoying life as a you know as part of a successful business. But we've never lost the passion, and that's the most important ingredient. Oh, and I think there's really good tip take home uh, masters there that you know you mentioned you had a gold medal and enthusiasm. You talked about your work ethic. Uh, your mother sending you to those classes obviously improved your confidence. So I think that really does show that with some mm. uh, people skills and a determination, you don't have to find the latest hack or you don't have no, to no. do this. You, know, you can build a lot for yourself from the ground up just that way. I think you, you've got to have a self-belief. I don't know where that comes from. I think probably again, going back to my mother, probably put it into me that, you know, my dad died very young. I was the, you know, the male in the family, you know, with council house people, no one really cares about you, do they? But what you've got to do is care about yourself and, and it's in your hands, your, your destiny. I mean, I'm a big believer that I think we're not perfect, but I think we live in one of the most perfect countries in the world in comparison to other countries, put it that way. So we have opportunity, but it's, it still rests with us to do, to get, you know, to get off and do it. If you believe in yourself enough, then you, you do have that opportunity to change your life. And that I find that very stimulating. I think one of the great things about sport is for me, is watching people change their lives through sport is is very motivating. When I see, you know, I always tell the story of a little flyweight boxer that came over from on a boat from Ghana, arrived in the East End, didn't know anybody, could have got into trouble. He's only five foot one, went into boxing, had a little bit of success. Uh, his name's Francis Ampufu. He boxed Robbie Regan in the Splot Centre in Cardiff and won the British title. He never won the world title. He, he got beat twice, but he earned a bit of money and he saved it all. He saved it all. One of my ingredients of life is you got to think poor. And he, he thought poor, so he didn't spend his money. And when he finished boxing, he bought a little bit of land in Norfolk and then he put some chickens on it. And today he's the biggest egg supplier in the country to Marks and Spencers. And he's making a lovely life for him and his family. And that came through sport, you know, sport can change so many things. It is such an important part of our life and we take it for granted sometimes, you know, but when, you know, you've got, well, this Saturday, you've got Joe Caldina boxing for the world title in Cardiff, and Sunday, you've got your world title qualifying rounds in, in Wales. The whole country is unified. Doesn't matter if you're fat, thin, Christian, Muslim, black, white, total, complete irrelevance. You're unified in sport, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. And, and another example that comes to my mind when, when uh, you described uh, that guy coming, coming over was Dave Allen. And I remember following that guy. I mean, and he was, 
you know, I, I had little hopes from him and to see what he did in the sport and to have a nice... <laughs> Amazing. I mean, sport creates those stories, don't they? But they need someone somewhere to give them the opportunity. And we all have excuses as to why it didn't happen for you. Why, you know, where did you go wrong? And most of the excuses, oh, I never got a chance. I never, some, you've got to get up and take your chance. But it does help if you've got some people out there that are passionate, that care about, you know, for me to watch, I mean, I think my biggest commercial success is darts, for example, bigger than boxing, really. And I see these blokes changing their lives through, you know, I look at Gerwin Price, for example, you know, rugby union, rugby league, reached a certain level, but darts has changed, fundamentally changed his life, and he can create legacy, opportunity for his children, his family, his friends, whatever he's in. And he brings pride to the community, which inspires others. It's a win-win situation if you do it properly. Yeah, sure. Um, we kind of talked about how you built this, uh, you know, this, as you said, in, in your own words, the kind of one of the biggest promotional companies in the world for sport. Mm -hmm. um, I would kind of love to ask you, because in the book you talk about how you know, people hear that and assume, wow, you know, this was this huge, huge success. But it wasn't always that way. No, so of I, course. I wonder if you could kind of talk about perhaps some of the lowest points that you had and kind of how you overcame them. Well, I think like everything else, the biggest weakness you can have in your life is complacency. Whether you're complacent with wives, girlfriends, friends, whatever, partners, once you get complacent, it's never quite the same. You know, you have to sort of be on the, a little bit on the edge. You have to appreciate what you've got. Business works the same way. You know, you work hard all your life. You get to a certain level and sometimes complacency kicks in. And I think I was a bit like that. 1982, I made a lot of money and I was going to retire. I was 34. I was going to go and play cricket, go golf. <laughs> After about six weeks, I was climbing up walls, you know. So... Then the recession started to kick in, 85, 86, 87, 88. And my business suddenly, all the money I'd made in 82, I'd lost it and millions more. I owed the banks a load of money. I'd actually invested in my passion for being sport. I'd, I'd seen the sign that sports television was going to eventually come into its own. And it hadn't at that stage. We just had BBC and ITV, Grandstand World of Sport, just a few hours sport a week. And I thought, well, they're going to need events. So I started investing in events, doing more and more shows, and every one of them lost money. I was about two years ahead of myself, but it worked out all right in the end because when they did come in and started spending, I was there ready to play. Right. But during those periods, it was very tough, you know. I mean, I remember I owned a snooker hall in Romford and we used to empty the fruit machines twice a week to pay the wages and things like that. And, you know, the, everything went wrong. You know, whatever you did, whatever you touched, it went wrong. And you have to keep it to yourself because you, you, you don't want to share those sort of miseries, those problems with the nearest and dearest because your job as a husband and a father is to protect those people from that, the real world. I don't share my problems. I solve my problems. But it took longer than I thought. And it was a very difficult couple of years. It actually culminated in, in one story that I think sums up what makes us tick in our family was Christmas. I think it was about 1988 or 89. I had a snooker event starting in January that needed a sponsor. My world is crashing down around me. I feel like I'm a boxer coming out for the 11th round and I'm wondering whether I'm so far behind on points, I may as well just jack in. But I'm not that type of person that jacks in. I can't help it. It's just the way I'm built. And I went to see Trust House 40, which were a hotel company. They were based in Slough. They were my last appointment to try and get a sponsor for this event in January, which is, and I'm literally, my heart, actually, to be fair, I was very close. My heart wasn't in it, you know. And I arrived at South Station at four o'clock in the afternoon on Christmas Eve. And it started to snow as I walked to their offices. It was something like, it looked like a Dickens novel. 
And I went up there, I saw the managing director, whose name was, funny enough, Alan Hearn. He, he wasn't related, I wish he had been. And I made the worst pitch ever, because I was just gone, you know, I was punched out, beat out, you know, get the referee to stop the fight, it's all over. And at the end of it, he looked at me and he said, you must really need this. He said, it's Christmas Eve. It's half past four. And I went, I do. To be honest with you, Mr. Hearn, I do need it. He went, well, I've got no money. And I thought, well, that is it. The last kick in the nuts. Happy Christmas. I can always get a job because I'm a qualified chartered accountant. I'm never going to starve. It wasn't that. But my dreams were not going to happen. You know, that was the sadness. And I thought, well, we'll take it with some class. So I just said, I understand that, Mr. Hearn. Thank you very much for your time. And I wish you and your family a happy Christmas and a great new year. And I turned around to walk out the building. And he said, but I do have hotel rooms. And I went, what does that mean? And he went, well, I've got no money. I said, I, I heard that bit. He said, but I've got hotel rooms. And I'll give you 300,000 pounds of hotel rooms instead of money to sponsor that event. And I said, now, bearing in mind in those days that Trust House 40 had Sandy Lane in Barbados, Plaza Athenae in New York and in Paris, uh, the Waldorf in so London, they had the best hotels. From when I left his office to when I got on my train at Slough, I had sold those 300,000 pounds at a 40% discount to friends in the travel business that knew me, that knew if I say something and I shake their hand, it's 100% gonna happen. And that 180,000 pound net saved my company and saved me because it gave me the belief in myself again that has never left me since that day. And that's how you recover, my friend. I love it. And one of the things there that is obvious is that you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. Mm. I mean, you're in a period there where, you know, you mentioned you had a fallback plan, but you're not too sure what's going to kind of happen with yeah, the company. What do you think it was that kind of got you through that time period? What was it that got you through those hard times? I just think self, be blind self-belief at some stage. I mean, you get to the certain stage where everyone tells you you're mad, but you just... There's something in the back of your head that says, I'm not buying that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not get, I'm not stopping, you know. Now it could be, it could be totally wrong. I appreciate there'll be other people to say I had the same feeling and I went bankrupt for millions of millions of pounds. But this business wasn't built on greed, it wasn't built on some of those, well, I call people fur coat, no knicker merchants, you know, the ones that want to get rich quick. I didn't want to get rich quick. I wanted to build a sustainable business that was a credit to everyone, that lived up, that created a legacy, but also rewarded sports that I personally was passionate about. For whatever reason, I've never been passionate about motorsport. I've never been passionate about tennis. I don't touch those sports. My time is the most important asset I have. Right. If I'm going to spend my time on it, it's got to be something I enjoy. But once I enjoy it, I buy into it and I really believe and my belief is built in concrete, you know? So right or wrong, and whether I've been lucky or not, or whether God has smiled at me or not, I'll take it as long as I get where I'm going. And I have always eventually got there. It hasn't always been quick, you know, but then you've got to have a little bit of pain to make some gain, haven't you? Sure, sure. I'd love to kind of ask you, um, because obviously we kind of talked a little bit about, about your son, Eddie Hearn, and when we asked our Instagram audience for questions, we had a, a large amount of, of questions uh, of and, and a lot of them kind of were, were about uh, yourself and Eddie. But I'd love to kind of ask you, um, what were kind of some of the values that you wanted to instill in Eddie as a parent? I think, you know, you always worry about your kids. I don't know why we do. Because most of the time, how you bring them up, you influence that you influence children enormously. So Eddie was spoiled, obviously, very, you know, grew up in entirely. I mean, I'm sitting talking to you now from what was my family home here, which is magnificent, but it's a long way from where I grew up. I mean, this place has got toilets indoors and everything. 
So what I was worried about him was getting spoiled and not respecting people properly and not, you know, being too full of yourself. And, and actually, I mean, we had this wonderful time when he was 16. I took him down to the gym to, to find out what type of kid he was. And my wife went potty. I said, oh, it just frustrated me because when I was growing up, kids like Eddie, I used to fight on the street with because I, you know, they did my head in. You know, I mean, I had a chip on my shoulder being working class. Someone who spoke nicely, you tend to whack, you know. Uh, not it doesn't make me a right person, by the way, but it, that's the hang ups you get. So I took Eddie down to the gym to give him a proper fight. I wanted to find out what type of man he really was. And he dropped me twice in the second round. And I left out, I was over the moon with that. And I, and I really felt from that stage is, no matter what's outward, inside, the knowledge is in there, you know, the depth is in there. So what do you try and tell them? You waste your time telling them a lot of things, but it's not a waste because it just goes a bit deeper and it takes years sometimes for it to come out. You say things like tell the truth. You know, lying's no good. Eventually you forget the lies and it comes back and haunts you. Telling the truth gets you. But did I tell the truth all the time when I was young? No, of course not. I'm not an angel. These days I do because I can't remember what I said a few weeks ago. So therefore you've got to make sure you tell the truth. Respect other people, you know, all that sort of stuff. Be straight. Be straight with people. And the other way, that involves also don't tolerate people that are not straight with you. Respect was both ways. Be 100% honest. I find now, as you get older, I have the luxury of being able to be honest with everybody. And if I don't like someone, I tend to tell them I don't like them. Because I haven't got time in my life to waste my time with people I don't like. When you're trying to do business with them, sometimes in the early days, you used to be nice to people you didn't like, didn't you? Mm. So that's okay. You have to go through that motion. But it all involves about being a better person and thinking like a better person. I'm not going to give you some narrative about religion and all that, but there is a bigger reason out there to have some principle and to know that when someone shakes your hand, they can take that handshake to the bank. When someone supports you, they would stand in front of you and take a bullet for you. That's when they're friends. So you'd be a little bit cynical about people until they prove themselves, but bear in mind that they're going to be the same with you. So it's not, it's a sort of an overgrowing principle. It's not a list of, and my book says there's 10 principles there, which I think are important for people to read in business. There's a, there's a letter I give my grandchildren telling them what we are and what they must expect as they get older. But most of it is a, an ongoing conversation piece by example. And it, I have to say, I couldn't be more happy with the way my kids had turned out. And I think they probably learned as much from their mother as they did from their father. I, I love the story about you going down the gym with Eddie. Proper fight. <laughs> Proper fight. I hit him with a right hand. I mean, I, he always take, you know, Eddie's like, oh, yeah. But I'll tell you the truth, mate. He came out, he's 16, he's like three and zero in little gym fights, you know. But he was a big lump. No, he's six four, he's a big boy. When you're 16, like you're not frightened of anything. He charged, I can remember the look on his face. He charged at me on the belt. Two minute rounds. I'm I'm trying to get every advantage. I was 47 at the time. I was still sparring a little bit. I hit him with a right hand. That is, I mean, I wasn't a big puncher anyway, but he's gone up my arm like that little zing you get when you hit someone properly. He didn't fall over. I thought I could have a problem here. <laughs> he'd, done, he'd done me like a kipper with body shots in the second round. I couldn't breathe. At the end of the second round, I went, that'll do it. And he went, you said you'd do three rounds. I went, you're going to kill your father. <laughs> and he, he still wanted to do the extra round. I wouldn't go near him. I went home. My wife said, if you hurt my son, I'm going to kill you. And I said, I'll tell you something. I'm never putting boxing gloves on again in my life. And I never have. <laughs> this won't be discussed again. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think would win, Eddie or Jake Paul? I think it's a, in all honesty, Jake Paul is fitter, fitter than Eddie for boxing. Eddie's very heavy handed. Um, he's a lump and he's in decent shape, actually. Um, he's training quite a lot. 
I mean, we're all, we're all competitive people. If Eddie hit him, I think he'd have him over. But I think if he didn't hit him early, Jake Paul would probably wear him down. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I tell you what, I'll give him five million each for that fight tomorrow. <laughs> that's gonna sell. That's gonna sell an awful lot of social hits on that. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, let me jump onto some of the kind of sports questions. Um, so obviously, in your field, you've promoted, as we kind of talked about, the snooker, the darts, the boxing. Uh, we kind of talked about some of the traits that you know have helped you get to kind of the top of your field. But I wonder in terms of kind of the athletes that you saw, were there kind of any common traits that you saw amongst them that let them get to the kind of top of their profession? I think it's, yeah, it also works in business. You know, there is a, there's a common trait of sacrifice, selfishness. You know, when you're in individual sport, you have, I mean, an individual businessman starts off. I mean, I was selfish for, well, I don't know how many years. My, my family probably think I still am now, but I was proper selfish, you know. I mean, my book says family first, business a close second. There was plenty of times when it was business first mm. and sometimes family not so close second, you know. You have to make, and, and, and you, you, you can always see with someone who is prepared to go that extra yard. Talk is cheap. Lots of people talk a great, great fight. But when they come into the trenches, they're not the same athlete, you know. I don't know a man that don't think he can fight. But you walk up those five steps up to the four-cornered ring, it's a long way. It's a, it's a big journey for some people, you know, and you, and you respect that. So there is that feeling of selfishness, I think, that prevails when you really want something so bad you can taste it every morning. I was like it in business. I think I still am a little bit. But sportsmen and women have to because they have to channel that into a short period of time. So that, you know, it's the ability, it's the ability to go to levels that other people don't go to. And that, that sums up what makes you special. A question that we got asked, kind of, I think, that is a nice follow-up to this one. It was from our uh, from our Instagram audience, and they wanted to know, um, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the, all the events that you've ever made, a question which came up quite a few times was, what was the biggest event or business deal or certain matchup that never happened? Oh, it's only one, isn't there? Ben Eubank three. I was so gutted. I mean, on, on a sporting level, that is my biggest disappointment because Ben Eubank one was was a great night for me because obviously established my relationship with Chris Eubank. We went on for twenty world title defenses. Having a world champion that you'd actually got there is very fulfilling. He was a friend. I was best man at his wedding. We made a load of money. He spent most of his, I didn't, you know, so that's the difference in personality. But then Ben Eubank too had to happen because Nigel being such a warrior and such a great, great fighter, you know, the animosity between them on Ben Eubank one was still there. It never really delivered in the same intensity that fight, in my view. A lot of people thought Nigel won, including Nigel. Uh, I didn't. I thought it was a draw, funny enough, as I predicted ringside or inside the ring on the night to Gary Newborn. Uh, but I should have done Ben Eubank three, but because Nigel thought he'd won the fight and he was really pissed off with me. So he, he went off with Don King and did his bits and pieces and uh, Eubank stayed with me and we missed it. That was the fight to launch British pay-per-view in this country. It would have been humongous. So that's from the sporting event one that got away. From a business point of view, what am I doing? I mean, I'm still playing cr cricket now for the Essex over 70s. I'm playing Kent this Thursday. I can't wait. I'm excited. I love playing cricket. I started when I was 12. I still play. I'm, obviously, I'm not getting better. Let me just put it kindly. I should have invented 2020. What am I thinking of? It's got my hand right all over it. It's when... Darts meets cricket, isn't it? Friday night, 2020. So that was the business one that got away. But along the way of ups and downs and things that missed, I hit a lot of targets. So I can't really complain too much. But And in a way, it's nice to know 
that you have missed out on a couple of things because it stops you getting complacent in the future. You think, I don't want that to happen again. So, you know, at the moment, the new one is uh, US pool, nine ball pool. Mm. I'm doing a global circuit on that, which is going very well, early doors. Snooker continues to grow, particularly in Southeast Asia and in, and in Europe. They've done very well. The darts has become a business that I can only dream of. How big that's got is it enormous. And that's a great sport because it's, it's ordinary people with extraordinary ability. And they're changing their lives much quicker because the prize money has grown so quick. It's brilliant to see. I love all that. And the boxing still gives you those moments that you can't ever forget. Some good, some bad. But it never leaves you bored because it is the toughest sport that's out there. I love it. I love it. Uh, we always kind of, just to kind of uh, sort of wrap this conversation up, we always go through a couple of quick fire questions. Yeah, of course. Uh, it wouldn't yeah. be the same without a quick fire question. A couple of quick fire questions. Um, what have been, or have there been, any uh, books or resources or a podcast or whatever it is that have really helped you or inspired you or that have kind of left a, a you know, that have developed you, you in some sort of way throughout uh, your life? None whatsoever. <laughs> School of hard knocks. School of life, mate. That's how you find out. You find out by doing it, by getting it wrong or getting it right and learning as you go forward. And it's personal to you. So it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not influenced by other people's rights. If, you, if I was going to be influenced by other people, and this is very boring for you, I'd be influenced by... Warren Buffett, and looking at a man in his 80s and say he's still enthusiastic about business, about buying companies, about expanding, about, you know, I, I find that fascinating. Still lives in the same house he's lived in for 60 years. Yeah. Still likes the same suit. Yeah, I mean, this is a phenomenon. And yet, why? Because that's what he wants to do with his life. I find that that is more inspiring to me than any podcast. There's no disrespect to you and your <laughs> podcast people, but to me, it's the people that have been out there and done it I want to learn from. If it, And there's not many of them. Warren Buffett would be right up there, number one. And he teaches you the benefits of management and giving opportunity to young people to, to grow within your company, which I've adopted. And all my key management have been with me for years and years. Some of them started when they were 15 years old. Some started when they were 20, and they're now major movers and shakers and I couldn't have better people running parts of my business. Well, that brings me nicely up my next question, which was going to be, who have been some of your heroes growing up? Well, sporting heroes. Anyone, it could be anyone that's just kind of, you really well, I mean, you, you can't have a conversation about boxing without talking about Muhammad Ali, obviously, because he was something special. But, you know, I like, I like lots of different stories about that, you know. Uh, I mean, we had that great film, Cinderella Man, you know, which, which shows you a journeyman fighter that becomes a world, you know, James Braddock, you know, it's a wonderful story. Sport creates personalities and creates great stories of how did they get there? And, and it's happening all the time, you know. I don't particularly like tennis, but the Nadal story is brilliant coming from a little village and ending up being a superstar on a global stage. So... There's lots of people there that are built to be your hero, aren't they? Right, uh, right. And I, but for me, it's not just sport. It can be in life. You know, there are certain people. Some people will talk about Nelson Mandela and say that he is the most original. You know, Martin Luther King, all these type of people have been inspirational. Perhaps sometimes we lose a little bit of context with the real world, with the world we live in. Fast fixes and quick podcasts. All right, exactly. I, I completely agree. Um, uh, my next question to you uh, that I would kind of, we always sort of um, ask at the end, particularly when we do kind of conversations like this would be, so person listening to this, so I guess perhaps, as you mentioned, you're on the verge of retiring. you kind of at the end, I guess, of your, your business, your kind of entrepreneurial career. Someone at the beginning, what would you advise them in the, the world of business? If you could give them, I know it's a quick fire piece of advice, but if you could give them some sort of advice to... <sighs> Brace yourself. You know when you get on an aeroplane, you know, 
Put that belt, put that belt around you and be prepared. <laughs> There's gonna be some turbulence along the way. If your bum goes during turbulence, you ain't gonna be an international traveler, are you? <laughs> uh, from your perspective, is expect the unexpected. Be prepared to deal with the changing environment. Be very tough with yourself. You gotta to be tougher with yourself than you are with other people. And if you don't believe in yourself and your ability to come through any obstacle or any problem, go and get another job. Because I ain't got time for you. I don't. The word pressure is, is actually invented for those people that fail. It's an excuse. And I don't like excuses. I look in the mirror and say, I ain't good enough. That's not an excuse. That's a statement. I look in the mirror and say, I will not be defeated. It's not a brag. That's the reality. And if you've got that, you'll go far, young man. My, my last question to you today, Barry, before I ask you to sign off and tell these guys where they can pick up your fabulous book and where <laughs> they can connect with you and everything else in between that we ask at the end of all of our podcasts is what makes a life worth living? The ability to do what I do every day. I'm surrounded by the sound of laughter and all I see is smiling faces. That'll do me. I love it. I love it. Where can these guys... Uh, well, I think, you got, listen, in, in, a, in a one vain attempt to sell more copies of my book than my son sold at his. Everything's available on Amazon, as it always is. Do you realise Amazon sell like 80% of the books in the UK? It's unbelievable. Uh, Waterstones, WA Smiths, all the usual suspects. And if you have a problem or isn't in your area where you can't get through, you can always tweet me at Barry Hearn on Twitter. No problem. <laughs> I love it. And for those watching on YouTube or on iTunes or Spotify, you can just swipe up on this episode and you can get Barry's book. Let's help him sell more copies than his son's. <sighs> it's a dream come. That would be a dream come true. Um, like everything else, you talk about advice as well. I'm trying to win, but I'm prepared to fail. But I'm never going to stop trying to win. That's what it's all about, man. Barry, this was such a, pr a, a pleasure. It was a real privilege getting yeah, to speak to you, to, you to drink into your wisdom. So thank you so, so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Do look after yourself, mate.